Imagine. Imagine a place where the people never sing, where they never play music, where they've never heard singing. That's what it was like on Windy Island, where Rose lived. Rose lived in a white house on a cliff next to the sea. In the front garden of her house, Rose grew flowers. In the back garden, she couldn't grow anything because there was no room. A huge clothesline stretched from one side of the fence to the other, then back again twenty more times. It crisscrossed the yard like a giant shoelace. It was on this clothesline that Rose hung out washing, because her job was washing other people's clothes. On Wednesdays and Fridays, people would walk along the narrow sea cliff path that led to Rose's house to deliver their dirty washing. With the sea breeze whistling in her ear and the soggy clothes flapping around her, Rose was at her happiest. And when Rose was happy, she would do something that no one else on Windy Island ever, ever did. She would sing. She'd sing about the wind blowing through the trees. She'd sing about her washing flapping in the breeze. She'd sing about the rain. She'd sing about the sun. She'd sing about her wooden pegs one by one. Round that wooden pegs on the line. Sing hey. Hold the clothes in the warm sunshine. Sing, hang out the washing home. Hang out, hang out the washing home. Hang out, hang out the washing home. The sea breeze blows with all its might. Sing, hang out the washing home. But my wooden pegs will hold on tight. Sing, hang out the washing home. Hang out, hang out the washing home. Rose knew that she was different. She had never met anyone else on Windy Island who sang, so Rose always kept her singing a secret. One afternoon, Rose's young friend Maeve was helping her take in the washing. Maeve was especially excited because that night she was going to sleep at Rose's house for the first time. As they folded the crisp, dry sheets together, Rose made up a limerick. There once was a girl called Maeve who lived in a damp old cave. She loved to feed on cold seaweed, or oh, yuck, which she gathered from the waves. That's silly, laughed Maeve. She loved it when Rose made up funny rhymes. I know, said Rose. Come on, let's go in. I've cooked your favourite dinner. What? shouted Maeve excitedly. Seaweed, of course, joked Rose. Maeve laughed again. Rose and Maeve always spent their time laughing, giggling and making up funny rhymes. Never singing. Not even Maeve knew that Rose sang. That night, Rose set up a bed on the couch for Maeve. But the girl had trouble sleeping. She tossed and she turned, she wiggled and she giggled. Rose came and sat next to her. You're not used to this bed, are you? She soothed. Then she looked at the clock. It's very late. Maeve wriggled some more. My goodness, laughed Rose. You are a wriggly worm. Now lie still now and listen. Listen to that old clock. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Maeve began to settle in her bed. 
Rose looked down at her and felt happy. Then, without thinking of what she was doing, she started to sing. The clock on the wall goes tick, tick, tock. It ticks when you're sleepy and when you're not. But isn't it so funny how that tick, tick, tock can make you feel so sleepy when you're not, not, not? Maeve had never heard such a peaceful floating sound before. She wanted to stay awake and listen to the high trills and the low thrills. But she couldn't keep her eyes open. What an adventure you've had today, staying at my place a long way away. And still that clock goes tick, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tick, tock. Tick will keep you as asleep you lay. Talk will wake you when it's time to play. The clock on the wall goes tick, tick, tock. It makes you feel so sleepy when you're not, not, not. Not, not, not. The next day, Rose walked Maeve home. As they walked, Rose wondered if Maeve remembered her singing the night before. Maeve didn't talk about it or ask any questions. Good, thought Rose. She's forgotten about it. A day passed and Rose was busy in her laundry with a big load of football jumpers when there was a knock at the door. It was Percival Flynn, the mayor of Windy Island. Most of the time he was a carpenter, but on special occasions he dressed in the fine crimson mare's robe of Windy Island and said important things. This must have been a special occasion because he was wearing the mayor's robe over his old green shirt and trousers. You've been keeping a little secret from us, Rose, said Percival Flynn. Secret? asked Rose. Yes, he said. Now why didn't you tell us you were able to make magic sounds that put people to sleep? At first Rose didn't know what Percival Flynn was talking about. Then she remembered the song she sang to Maeve. She must have told them about it. That's not magic, said Rose. That's singing. Will you sing for me now? he asked eagerly. I can't just sing at any old time, explained Rose. I need to be in the right mood. Will you be in the right mood this Saturday at one o'clock then? He persisted. I don't know. I might be. Jolly good, boomed Percival Flynn. One o'clock it is then. I've already invited everyone from the island to come and hear you. Don't forget, one o'clock at the town hall. And with that, he turned and walked away. Rose felt befuddled and muddled. She didn't want to sing in front of people. What if they laughed at her? She thought about running after Percival Flynn to tell him she wouldn't do it, but it really was too late. He had invited all the people of Windy Island to hear singing. Her singing. Over the next few days, Rose was so nervous she couldn't sleep. She barely ate, and worst of all, she couldn't sing. She kept thinking about the town hall. She muddled up her washing orders and dropped things. By the time Saturday came, Rose was a twitter with nerves. She put on her best dress and her favourite pearl necklace, then began the long, slow walk into town. As she walked, a song came into her head. It wasn't a happy, cheery song. It was a slow, mournful, worrying kind of song. My feet trudge, oh so slow, towards the hall and this silly show. My feet trudge, oh so slow, but not slow enough. 
my heart beats oh so quick. My tummy churns, I feel a little sick. My heart beats oh so quick. she walked, Rose couldn't stop her feet from leading her to the town hall. When she got there, an incredible sight greeted her. Every single man, woman and child who lived on the island was packed into the old wooden building. It wasn't very big and it certainly wasn't made to fit all the people of Windy Island. There were mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers, aunties, uncles and sons, daughters and nieces, nephews and cousins, packed in one by one. They sat on the rafters, they sat in the aisles, they sat in the window sills. They were Michaels and Marys, Davids and Daphnes, Jacks and Johns and Jills. Sitting in the front row was Percival Flynn and his wife. He stood up and waved to Rose to come over when he saw her. Rose felt her knees go wobbly as together they climbed the steps onto the stage. She fiddled with the pleats of her dress as Percival Flynn announced that there would now be a demonstration of magic. Then he sat down at his seat and she was alone. This is not magic, said Rose. It's singing. Really, there's nothing special about it. No one said a word. They all sat staring at her. There was nothing left for her to say. The time had come to sing. But what should she sing about? Should she sing about her washing? Should she sing about her cat? Should she sing about her wooden pegs? Should she sing about that? She closed her eyes. Then she sang. When your work is done and the night has come with a dark and cold embrace Then huddle in your blankets and remember these sounds I made It's a song I sing, I sing for you, for you to always keep so keep this song and you will have my lullaby for you, for you, my lullaby for you. When your day is grey, you're in a sad, bad way And you'll never smile again Then settle in a comfy place, my song will come to you It's a song I sing, I sing for you For you to always keep So keep this song and you And there it was. The people of Windy Island had now heard singing. She opened her eyes and was amazed at what she saw. Everyone in the town hall was fast asleep and snoring. Even Percival Flynn was snoring. Rose started to giggle. It was such a funny sight. She put her hand over her mouth to stop laughing and tiptoed from the hall. It would be a shame to wake them, she thought. As she left, she didn't notice that one person was still awake in the hall. One person hadn't fallen asleep with her singing, but instead had sat with wide eyes and a thrill in her heart. It was Maeve, and this was the second time she'd heard singing. The next day, Rose was in her laundry firing up the copper when there was a knock at the door. It was Percival Flynn again, only this time he had a large group of people with him. 
Each of them carried blankets and pillows, and they cheered when they saw Rose. Hooray for Rose, the sleep maker! they shouted. Rose closed the door again. She could hear Percival Flynn speaking from the other side of the door. Now, now, Rose, don't be shy. We've come to hear some more of your magic. Please go away now, said Rose through the keyhole. I'm in no mood for singing. As the mayor of Windy Island, Rose, I must ask you to open this door and hear what I have to say, said Percival Flynn. Rose opened the door a little and said, Yes? Percival Flynn tried to look important. The people of Windy Island have asked me to give you the job as the official sleep maker, he said in a deep voice. I'm not a sleep maker, said Rose. I wash clothes. With your magic singing, no one will ever have trouble getting to sleep. Isn't that right? shouted Percival Flynn to the people around him. They all cheered very loudly again. It was so loud that they couldn't hear Rose. She was trying to tell them that she didn't want to be a sleep maker, that she was happy washing clothes. They cheered some more, then turned and walked away. As the crowd left, Rose saw Maeve standing near the gate. Maeve, it's you, said Rose. I heard you singing at the town hall, said Maeve. Everyone did, sighed Rose. No, said the girl. They all fell asleep in the middle of your song. I really did hear you. I didn't sing you to sleep? Maeve shook her head. I want to sing too. I want to make those funny sounds you make, said Maeve. Can I? Can you make me sing, Rose? I don't know, said Rose. And she really didn't. No one had made her sing. She just did it. And what would you like to sing about? asked Rose. My dog, said Maeve. I've made up a rhyme. Well, why don't you just try singing it and see what happens, said Rose. So Maeve started to sing her rhyme. My dog sniffs, so do I. My dog licks, and I can too. My dog runs and jumps and plays, so can I, can you. Rose laughed as she heard Maeve's song. She laughed because she loved the song. She laughed because it made her feel happy. But most of all, she laughed because it was the first time she had heard someone else sing. They spent the rest of the afternoon making up rhymes and singing them together. The next day, Rose walked into town. Not to start work as the sleep maker, she had other ideas. She went to the town hall and announced in a loud voice that she would sing there in one hour. The people nearby rushed about telling all they met to come quickly and hear Rose's magic singing again. And come they did. Some walked, some rode on bicycles, some ran and some were pushed in wheelchairs. Every single one of them brought blankets and pillows. Percival Flynn came and he brought two pillows. Rose smiled when she saw him. She stood on the stage and said to them, I told you all last time that this was not magic, that it was simply singing. Now I will show you how simple it is. And then she sang. Where does a song begin? Where does a song come from? Where does a song belong? A song begins with you With what you say and do You make a song Sing because you feel the wind Sing because you're with a friend Whatever you sing about whatever you do A song starts with you A song can make you brave Or melt a heart of stone Or float like a swan 
A song is hot and cold, a song is night and day, you make a song. Sing because you feel the wind. Sing because you're with a friend. Whatever you sing about whatever you do, a song starts with you. And then Rose stopped singing. The people in the hall were shocked. Some of them started chanting, More singing! More singing! But Rose wouldn't sing. She left the town hall and went to the park nearby. She sat on a seat and listened to the birds chirping in the trees. Birds sing too, thought Rose. Then she wondered how it was that no one else had ever sung on Windy Island before. She could hear music and singing all around her. There was music in the trees with the rustling of the leaves. There was singing all around with the bird's sweet chirping sound. Then Rose heard another sound, a sound she had never heard before. Voices, many voices, and they were all singing. She listened closely and then she heard what they were singing. It was Maeve's song, Maeve's song about her dog. Rose laughed again with joy. She laughed even harder when she recognised the loudest voice. It was Percival Flynn's. For the first time in her life, Rose felt the thrill of hearing people singing together. It was a sound she hoped to hear many more times on Windy Island. When your work is done and the night has come with a dark and cold embrace Then huddle in your blankets and remember these sounds I made It's a song I sing, I sing for you, for you to always keep. So keep this song and you will have my lullaby for you, for you, my lullaby for you. My song will come to you It's a song I sing, I sing for you For you to always keep So keep this song and you will have My lullaby for you For you My lullaby for you There's an island way out in the sea 
Where the babies, they all grow on trees And it's jolly good fun to swing in the sun But you gotta watch out if you sneeze, sneeze Gotta watch out if you sneeze Yeah, you've gotta watch out if you sneeze For swinging way up in the trees You're liable to cough, you might very well fall off And tumble down, flop on your knees, knees Tumble down, flop on your knees And when the stormy winds wail And the breezes blow up in a gale There's a curious flopping and plopping and dropping Fat little babies just hail, hail Fat little babies just hail And the babies lie there in a pile And the grown-ups they come after a while They always pass by all the babies that cry And take only babies that smile, smile Take only babies that smile even triplets and twins if they'll smile One sunny morning, Mr Murgatroyd was riding his bicycle into town. His bicycle was red with a white seat and Mr Murgatroyd wore a yellow crash helmet. As he was riding along, Mr Murgatroyd saw his friend Mrs Abercrombie walking along the side of the road. He pulled over. Good morning, Mrs Abercrombie, he boomed. And where are you off to in such a hurry on this fine morning? Oh, Mr Murgatroyd, panted Mrs Abercrombie. My car has broken down and I'm late for my meeting. Dear me, said Mr Murgatroyd. Can't have you being late. Your scones will get cold and they taste so delicious when they're warm. I know, Mr Murgatroyd, I know, said Mrs Abercrombie. I tell you what, said Mr Murgatroyd. You give me one of those delicious scones of yours and I'll give you a lift into town on my bike. Mrs Abercrombie laughed. Mr Murgatroyd used to give her lifts on his bicycle when they were school children. I'm serious, said Mr Murgatroyd. OK, I will, said Mrs Abercrombie. It'll be like the old days. Giggling and laughing, Mrs Abercrombie hopped onto the handlebars of the bicycle. With a heave and a shove, Mr Murgatroyd rode off towards town. After a while, he saw his good friend Kate walking next to the road. He pulled over. Good morning, Kate, he said. Where are you off to in such a hurry? Oh, Mr Murgatroyd, my telephone is broken so I have to rush into town to fetch the vet. It's my dog, Bill. He's sick. Dear me, said Mr Murgatroyd. You'd better hop on board then. This is an emergency. So Kate hopped onto the back of Mr Murgatroyd's bicycle. With a heave and a shove and a push, he rode off towards town. Very soon they came upon the Johnston twins walking towards town in their school uniforms. Mr Murgatroyd pulled over. Good morning, girls, said Mr Murgatroyd cheerily. He was about to say, where are you off to? When they both said at once, oh, Mr Murgatroyd, we've missed our bus and we're late for school. Dear me, said Mr Murgatroyd, you can't be late for school. There's room next to me, said Kate. And me, said Mrs Abercrombie. Well, I don't know, said Mr Murgatroyd. It's not very safe. Oh, come on, Mr Murgatroyd, said Mrs Abercrombie. What could go wrong? All right then, hop on board, said Mr Murgatroyd, shaking his head. So the Johnston twins hopped on, one at the back with Kate and one at the front with Mrs Abercrombie. With a heave and a shove and a push and a sigh, Mr Murgatroyd rode off towards town. Kate told Sally Johnston about her dog and Mrs Abercrombie gave Mary Johnston a pumpkin scone. After some riding, they came upon the Bertoli triplets rushing towards town. Mr Murgatroyd pulled over. 
Before he even had a chance to say good morning, the three boys cried, Oh, Mr Murgatroyd, our taxi didn't arrive and we'll miss our train. We're going to see our nonna. Dear, dear me, said Mr Murgatroyd. Can't have you missing out on seeing your nonna. I'd offer you a lift, but I'm afraid there's not much room. There's plenty of room, said Kate. Heaps of it, said Mrs Abercrombie. Stacks of it, said the Johnston twins. All right then, said Mr Murgatroyd. You'd better hop on board. So the three boys hopped on, one standing on the seat behind Mr Murgatroyd and the other two standing either side of him. With a heave and a shove and a push and a sigh and a groan, Mr Murgatroyd rode towards town. What a sight they were too. With some of them standing and some of them sitting, they looked like a bicycle act from the circus. And they were having a fine old time too, laughing and chatting, even singing songs. All Mr Murgatroyd could do was pedal. There were so many passengers and they were so heavy he was going red in the face. Then along came Constable Down, the policeman. He rode up beside Mr Murgatroyd and his many, many passengers. Oi there, he shouted. Where do you lot think you're going? We're going into town, they all answered. Not like that, you're not, said Constable Down. It's dangerous. Dangerous? said Mrs Abercrombie. Are you sure? said Kate. Oh dear, said the Johnston twins. Mamma mia, said the Batoli triplets. You'd better stop, said Constable Down. But Mr Murgatroyd couldn't stop. All he could do was pedal. Pedal, pedal, pedal. In fact, he couldn't even hear Constable Down. Worst of all, he couldn't see where he was going because he had his eyes closed. He was concentrating. Mr Murgatroyd's bicycle sped faster and faster down the big hill that led to town. Constable Down couldn't keep up. Everyone on board closed their eyes too and hoped for the best. Oh dear, dear me, they cried. Then Mrs Abercrombie opened her eyes. She had a brilliant idea. She took out one of her freshly baked scones, turned around and put it in Mr Murgatroyd's mouth. This had the most marvellous effect on Mr Murgatroyd. He opened his eyes, smiled and put the brake on. When the bicycle had stopped safely, his many, many passengers hopped off. Mr Murgatroyd quietly munched on his scone. You make the best scones this side of the black stump, Mrs Abercrombie, he said. Thank you, Mr Murgatroyd, she replied. Then Mr Murgatroyd noticed how upset and windswept everyone looked and he remembered the terrible bicycle ride. Oh me, oh my, he moaned. The twins got to school on time, the triplets caught their train, Kate went to the vet, Mrs Abercrombie went to her meeting and Mr Murgatroyd had a cup of tea at the police station. The spectacular bicycle ride soon became famous in the town. Mr Murgatroyd and his many, many passengers formed a special club after that day. It meets every Sunday morning for a bicycle ride into town. But not all on Mr Murgatroyd's bicycle. This time they have their own red bicycles and their own yellow crash helmets. And the name of their club? The Scone Club. Rock and roll and ride 
and roll and ride and out along the bay, all bound for morning town, many miles away. Somewhere there is sunshine. Somewhere there is day. Somewhere there is morning town, many miles away. Rock. The big bloke Benson came to town in a coat all tattered and torn. Its sleeves were short, the buttons gone. He'd worn it since he was born. Tall as a house and taller still, he walked about with pride. He'd fill up the biggest building if he could fit inside. Now Benson was a gentle chap with a great big friendly smile. He'd come to town to see the tailor, and he'd walked for many a mile. The big bloke said, "Good morning," and the tailor looked up from his chores. Then he looked and looked up further still, till he stopped at Benson's jaw. "Dear me, dear sir," said the old tailor, "you certainly are a sight." "I would be tailor," said Benson sadly, "with a coat that looked all right." "Do you see this coat I'm wearing? I've loved it night and day, but now I need a brand new one for work and rest and play." The tailor looked the big bloke over and slowly scratched his chin. I'll need meters and meters and meters of cloth before I even begin. Go to it," said Benson as he lay down outside the tailor's door. "Wake me up when the job is done, and not a single second before." The tailor scoured all through his shop for any cloth he could find—red cotton, grey wool, blue pinstripe, anything he didn't mind. Then he set to work at his sewing machine and sewed the smooth with the rough. But when he'd sewn all the pieces together, he still didn't have enough. More cloth! cried the tailor desperately. If I'm to make this coat to fit, bring me your cloth, long and short, and I'll pay you well for it. So the people brought cloth from near and far, from every part of town: curtains and blankets, tea towels and towels, carpets and eider downs. And the tailor sewed into the night as he joined the bits together. At last, he'd sewn enough for the coat and said to himself, "That's better." Then for fourteen days he measured and cut and measured and cut again, till at last the coat it was complete, and he showed it to his man. The big bloke tried the big coat on. He thought it looked quite sound, with bits of cloth and material from the people all around. Benson paid the tailor his fee and left for adventures to seek. The people were proud of that great big coat, and the tailor, he slept for a week. <laughs> Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Papa's gonna buy you a mockingbird. If that mockingbird don't sing, Papa's gonna buy you a diamond ring. If that diamond ring turns brass. Papa's gonna buy you a looking glass. If that looking glass gets broke, Papa's gonna buy you a billy goat. If that billy goat won't pull, Papa's gonna buy you a cotton. Cotton bull fall over. 
Papa's gonna buy you a dog named Rover. If that dog named Rover won't bark, Papa's gonna buy you a horse and cart. If that horse and cart fall down, you'll still be the cutest little baby in town. Her father said she has to have a name not the same as her mom's, but a name just the same. A little ray of sunshine has come into the world. A little ray of sunshine in the shape of a girl. We'll show her the dress that she'll wear with the gold flowing hair that nature provided. A little ray of sunshine has come into the world. A little ray of sunshine in the shape of a girl. If you think she looks good in the pink that Grandma has bought her, our own little daughter. A little ray of sunshine in the shape of a girl. She's just like her father. I think that I'd rather her hair was much darker. A little ray of sunshine has come into the world. A little ray of sunshine in the shape of a girl. Ooh.